Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. It's a big election week for Western democracies. Canada held a national election on Monday and Germany is preparing to vote on Sunday. In Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called a snap election in August in an apparent attempt to expand his minority government into a majority. The bid failed, and when all the votes are tallied, his Liberal Party will end up with just about the same number of seats in Parliament that it began with. The Liberal Party will, however, remain the largest party in Parliament, and Trudeau will keep his position as Prime Minister. In Germany, Angela Merkel is stepping aside after 16 years as Chancellor. She's been a symbol of stability during the European debt and refugee crises, and has weathered a rise in populism and Britain's exit from the European Union. Her tenure has lasted the span of four American presidents, and now German voters will decide what the country's politics look like without her at the helm. The polls are close, and the three biggest parties have all taken a turn in the lead. So today, we're going to take a rare opportunity to turn our focus abroad and see how other democracies' electoral systems work and what cleavages their politics are facing. So we will kick things off with that Canadian election and move on to Germany in the second half of the show. Here with me to discuss Canada is 538 Politics reporter Kaylee Rogers. Kaylee is from Ontario and has covered a number of Canadian elections, including at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Hello, Kaylee. Hi, how's it going? Going well. Um, (laughs) Glad that you're able to join us to talk talk about your home country for for a little while. Yeah, Um, we'll see how bad my accent gets as the show goes on. (laughs) I mean, I mean, how good your accent gets. Um, I'm I'm eager to hear it. Also here with us is Eric Grenier. He runs the poll tracker for the CBC and writes the newsletter The Writ. Welcome, Eric. Hello. So first off, let's let's keep it broad to start. What were your key takeaways from the results of Monday's election? Eric, kick us off. Well, in the end, it is a parliament that looks almost exactly like the one that was elected back in 2019. We did have some actual shifts in seats at the provincial level, but they canceled each other out. So in the end, this is an election that looks a lot like the one we saw last time, but it didn't have to end that way. Because when the campaign began, uh, the Liberals and Justin Trudeau were leading in the polls. There was a good chance that they could actually get their majority government. And at the midpoint of the campaign, though, the Conservatives under Aaron O'Toole, they did actually move ahead. So the fact that the Liberals ended up with a minority government with about as many seats as they did have last time is a bit of a relief for a lot of Liberals. Because uh, a couple of weeks ago, they might have actually lost this election. Yeah, I mean, uh, Lisa Raitt on the CBC called it a $600 million cabinet shuffle, which I think a lot of Canadians are kind of feeling at this point. Um, you know, Trudeau's explanation for why he called this election was sort of claiming that he needed a, he never used the word majority, but he needed a, a stronger mandate in order to pursue kind of more aggressive uh, policies, especially around COVID with like a vaccine mandate or pa- a national passport system or things like that. That was always like kind of fishy because he's been able to govern this entire time with a minority government. Um, there's a long history of Canada of getting a lot of things done under a minority government. So it's unclear why he would need to have a majority to do any of these things. Um, and clearly he didn't get that. So it was uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, money and time for not a big change. So why did he call this snap election if presiding over a minority government wasn't actually getting in the way of pursuing his legislative priorities? You know, in Canada, when we have minority governments, the prime minister is able to decide when they want to have an election. Uh, We do have a a law in Canada that has a fixed election date, but it's almost a suggestion. It's not actually anything that the prime minister has to pay attention to. The idea is that uh, calling an early election is going to have some blowback, so they might not want to do it. In this case, uh, Justin Trudeau's numbers out of the pandemic were quite high. His party was leading in the polls. And while he was able to govern in the minority government pretty well, he had support from the New Democrats, uh, the uh, left of center party in Canada. Um, I think that they made the calculation that the longer they waited, the less likely that things were going to keep being as positive as they were. Uh, The next election was only scheduled to be in 2023. But if he had waited two years, he would be giving the opportunity to the opposition parties to defeat his government in the House and call an election on their term. So I think that while they didn't get the majority they thought they could get, they didn't think it was a slam dunk. They thought they had about a 50-50 shot at one. Um, If they would have waited, maybe they wouldn't have even got the minority that they got this time. So I think it was a calculation that sooner was better than later and might as well go on our terms rather than give the opposition the chance to, you know, kick us when we're down. Interesting. The 
plays that get made when politicians themselves get to decide when elections happen. I am curious, though, because I've read some analysis after the fact that essentially suggested that while Parliament has remained almost exactly the same in terms of seat numbers, that this election did actually reconfigure Canadian politics in some important ways. Do either of you agree with that analysis? I mean, to an extent, you know, we had O'Toole coming in as a fairly moderate leader of the Conservative Party and taking that approach into an election. Um that can be debated how successful that was, you know. Uh, so I think that that's going to be a big topic of conversation for the Conservatives going forward, how moderate they want to keep their platform going forward. The People's Party of Canada, which is a sort of fringy, further right party, um, picked up quite a lot of the popular vote. They didn't get any seats, but they had more of the popular vote than even the Green Party, which is a more established um, left-wing party in Canada. So, I mean, we're, we were able to gauge a little bit about where Canadians' politics are shifting and how the vote is splitting, even among parties that didn't get any seats, even though there wasn't major shifts in the sort of makeup of Parliament itself. I think the, uh, the outcome we'll find out in a while, because it does depend on what's going to happen with the Conservative Party. Because Aaron O'Toole, he ran for the leadership of the party on a right-wing platform. He ran as a true blue conservative. Blue is the conservative color in Canada. And he ran as someone to the right of his main rival who was seen as a centrist, uh, progressive conservative, as we called him in Canada. Um, what happened, though, is that Aaron O'Toole decided to run in the center. And for a lot of conservatives, they didn't choose him to run as a centrist candidate. He did that because he's making the pitch that you can win in areas like Ontario and Quebec where the voting electorate is a bit more to, uh, towards the center, that if the party moves to the center, they can get more votes and they can win an election. But they lost another election without any real gains in Ontario and Quebec. And a lot of conservatives might start asking, should we go back to the right? The People's Party took a lot of our votes. Do we need to return to our principles to try to uh, win the next election and stop pretending that we're centrist. If the Conservatives decide to do that and they elect a much further right leader to replace Aaron O'Toole if he doesn't survive, then th that'll be a big consequence. The party will go back to being uh, where it was before. But if they decide to continue along this path that Aaron O'Toole has set out, then that opens up the question of if Canadian politics does move more to the centre, uh, what does that do to a people, uh, party like the People's Party? How do the Liberals react? So the consequences kind of have to, we have to wait and see. The realignment could happen, but uh, it just depends what the parties decide to do with it. For some background here, what do the main Canadian political parties represent and how might you compare them to American politics? Well, you can just actually just look at who endorsed who in this uh, election. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton gave their endorsement to Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. I think that kind of shows you where the Liberal Party is. More of the not, not the left wing of the Democratic Party, maybe a little bit further to the left in the center. Bernie Sanders gave his support to Jagmeet Singh, who's leader of the New Democrats. The, they're called the New Democrats, despite the fact that the party has existed since 1961. Um, so they're much more of the, you know, the Justice Democrats. AOC would probably vote for the NDP. And then for the Conservatives, you know, maybe it's like a John Kasich would lead that kind of party. Maybe a Mitt Romney if he was a little, um, a little bit more to the center. Whereas the People's Party, uh, Maxim Bernier, who leads that, he's a former conservative leadership candidate who failed to win that leadership. He would probably get the backing of Donald Trump. Uh, I think that's where things kind of align in terms of the party, uh, the party spectrum. I would say overall, though, the entire Canadian political spectrum is just slightly to the left of the American spectrum. The furthest right in the American spectrum politically isn't really on the map in Canada and the furthest left in Canada I feel like it isn't quite on the map in the United States. Given that Canada just had an election and was able to gauge where the public support lies, how like similar are the cleavages within Canadian politics to those within American politics? Is populism on the rise? Is that fair to say in Canada? I think populism is on the rise when you see the uh, People's Party uh, getting 5% of the vote, which might not sound like a lot, but they had 1.6% in the last election. Uh, but I think the cleavages in Canadian politics are 
not as stark as in American politics. Uh, you know, I've seen polls in the United States where Democrats would not be happy if their daughter or son married a Republican and the same kind of thing. In Canada, we don't really have that same kind of partisan split. Conservatives don't hate liberals unless they, you know, work for the party. And on the left, you know, with the liberals and the New Democrats, they agree on a lot more than they disagree. Um, a lot of the splits are on how big of the government it should be. The conservative uh, platform was a big spending platform. Uh, it would not you know, look a lot like a, a Republican Party fl platform. And then we also have just regional splits. We have the Bloc Québécois, which is a party that supports independence for Quebec, is more of a regionalist party. And that is just a whole other dynamic uh, that uh, you, know, you don't have in the United States. Yeah, that's one thing that's pretty unique about Canada. We also just don't have quite the same level of identity politics playing in. It has a lot more to do with policy and, and as Eric said, like sort of size and role of government rather than, uh, yeah, these more identity politics that have really taken a hold in the United States. Um, as far as more like cultural issues or social issues, things like abortion in Canada isn't really debated in the same way. Um, sort of the major sticking point is, for example, the Conservative Party uh, allows its members to sort of vote their conscience on any abortion bill that may come to the table, whereas the Liberal Party expects all of its members to always uphold the, the right to access to abortion. That's pretty much as contentious as it gets um, compared to the states, obviously, where it's still kind of an active debate. Kaylee, what were, you said that it's more of like a policy focus, what were the issues that this election was waged over? I mean, where you're seeing some of the divergence and, and changes definitely uh, circulated around COVID and, and what we want to do as far as approaching policies around that. There's been, just as in the States, a lot of pushbacks against mask mandates, vaccine man mandates, um, vaccine passports, people who may even be okay with a vaccine, they're not necessarily anti-vax, but feeling like that's a bit of government overreach or it's infringing on people's personal rights, things like that. Um, so that's where the People's Party was really able to collect a lot of support because it, they were very strongly against um, any kind of vaccine mandates and actually wanted to reduce a lot of the, the COVID protections that were put in place, whereas uh, the Liberals have, have been a lot more um, strong on their, their vaccine requirements they want to bring in, as I said, a, a national passport system. They've made it so that all federal employees have to be vaccinated. They put limits on travel requirements for vaccination, things like that. So that was a big sort of sticking point for a lot of people. And then also just, you know, the the ramifications around the pandemic as everywhere have, have trickled down where people are concerned about employment, about housing prices, about you know, the, the economy and where things are going. So that's sort of where a lot of the, the sticking points were. Um, and the environment and climate change is, again, another one that is top of mind for a lot of Canadians. The platforms kind of ranged as far as how far they wanted to go and their, their way that they wanted to tackle climate change, but nobody really like avoided that altogether. One of the criticisms of Jagmeet Singh's platform was that it was very similar to the Liberals. Um, and so he spent a lot of time kind of comparing himself and saying, you know, we need someone new, we need to have someone that's going to keep their promises because Trudeau has, you know, not kept this promise and that promise, um, rather than focusing on the actual policy points, because they weren't actually all that different. Yeah, I think that's one of the things from this election is that there wasn't a huge amount of daylight between the main parties on a lot of issues. So it wasn't really a campaign dominated by a single issue. It was mostly dominated by whether you could trust, uh, you know, Aaron O'Toole, whether you wanted to reward J uh, Justin Trudeau for his, uh, you know, politically cynical move to call an election, whether Jagmeet Singh, uh, you know, you believe that when he said that Justin Trudeau wasn't a true progressive, there wasn't really a single issue that really dominated this campaign. It just kind of stumbled from one, um, one kind of controversy to another uh, until we got to the end of it. And it was, by American standards, an extremely short campaign, I think just 36 days, something that is unimaginable to somebody who's covered presidential elections for up to two years. Um, but uh, let's let's get to some of the wonky stuff here. So conservatives actually won the largest share of the popular vote, almost 34 percent. Liberals won only about 32 percent of the vote, but they likely won 158 seats compared to conservatives, about 120. Of course, some votes are still being tallied here. So it looks like Canadian politics has the opposite bias that American politics has, which is that um, you know, liberals have an easier time turning their vote share into seat share. 
What's the dynamic that creates that bias in Canadian politics? I think the biggest difference is that we don't really reward uh, land with uh, extra seats or extra votes, like with the Electoral College in the United States. So uh, the way that our uh, system works is that it's more or less the House of Representatives and whoever has the biggest party gets to um, gets to form the government. And what we have is that the Liberals are very popular in urban areas. The Conservatives are very popular in, ur- in rural areas. Uh, but in the places where the Conservatives are popular, they win 60, 70, 80 percent of the vote. Whereas the Liberals, when they win seats in Toronto, for example, our biggest city, you know, they'll win those seats with 40, 50 percent. You don't have blowouts. You don't have Liberal blowouts. You have Conservative blowouts. So they run up the numbers in a lot of these areas in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, whereas the Liberals are able to win by narrow margins. So the net effect is that the Conservatives have these very, very big uh, popular vote margins in some parts of the country, but it doesn't give them any extra seats. Um, And so this happened in 2019. And we'll see once all the mail ballots are counted, it looks like the popular vote might be somewhere around one point for the Conservatives when it's all said and done. But um, our system is not, you know, it doesn't produce a parliament that looks like the national popular vote. Yeah, I read that some vote splitting between the Conservatives and the People's Party may have cost Conservatives up to 24 seats. Um, does that mean that, as it currently stands, the People's Party is is making it difficult for Conservatives to to actually, you know, win control and potentially a majority? Yeah, I think that the, it is an impact that the PPC has had on this campaign. But one of the questions for me is, is you know, the People's Party is a new party. We don't really know that much about their electorate. Uh, it's a little bit like trying to find the Trump voters in the United States. The pollsters did have some difficulty trying to figure out who was uh, supporting the PPC. Uh, a lot of them might be people who didn't vote in past elections. And while the Conservatives lost the most votes to the PPC, that's undeniable, the Conservatives also moved to the center, which might have pushed some people to the PPC. So if the PPC didn't exist, some of their supporters might just have stayed home. Uh, But certainly some of these ridings are going to be decided by a few hundred votes, and the PPC has a few thousand in some of these. So it's easy to to find two, three, four hundred people who voted for the People's uh, Party that could have ended up voting conservative. Kaylee, you know that, of course, something that we talk about all the time in domestic American politics are criticisms, more so from the left, about our electoral system. Are there real criticisms of the Canadian electoral system within Canada? No, everybody loves it. It's perfect. No. Uh, Yeah, there's definitely criticisms of the electoral (laughs) system. I think some Americans imagine that there's like a country out there where like the electoral system just works perfectly and everyone loves it. And and of course, there probably are better systems than the one we have here in the United States. Um, but uh, but I'm sure people will also be happy to hear that Canadians are not happy with their own electoral system. Anyway, what are the criticisms, Kaylee? I mean, the biggest problem is that the way the system is designed, the first past the post, uh, you end up with this, but where vote splitting has kind of an outsized impact and where somebody with you know, just a plurality of of the vote ends up winning the seat, even if, you know, you combined, let's say, the People's Party and Conservative votes into one group saying these are more right wing voters, um, they might outnumber the party candidate who actually won the seat. Um, One of the things that Trudeau originally campaigned on back in 2015 was electoral reform and considering different methods of making up the government. But that was never never came to pass, um, which disappointed a lot of voters. And it's something that's sort of a perennial discussion in Canada as to are there better ways? What other systems can we look at from parliamentary systems around the world uh, that might be a better option, whether that's, you know, mixed member proportional representation. uh, I'm pretty sure the way they do it in Germany is a little more related you'll find out i'm sure in the next half about uh actually closer to the actual popular vote so there are other ways to do it it's something that's always a topic of conversation in canada Uh, but uh, some of the differences though that are pretty stark and i think that canadians appreciate uh money is not a huge issue in canadian politics the most Mm -hmm. that an individual can donate is about 1600 canadian dollars which i don't know what the exchange rate is but it's about 1200 bucks um, companies, you know, corporations aren't able to donate to political parties. So money does not have the same role that it does in uh, American politics. And we also don't have any sort of gerrymandering. All of our ridings uh, or districts, uh, we call them ridings, uh, are drawn by nonpartisan commissions that are uh, set up in each province. So they aren't in any way partisan. Uh, there's no such thing as gerrymandering really in Canadian politics. So I think those are two things that are really 
pretty important. Also, we don't have a primary system which has some uh, some impacts in American politics that might push uh, push the parties further to the right, further to the left. In our system, the parties in most cases can decide who their candidate is going to be in a given riding, and um, and just it's just party members who end up choosing the leader of the party, and and that's only a few hundred thousand people at most. There's no such thing as a registered Democrat, a registered Republican. We don't have that kind of system here in Canada. Interesting. And you mentioned the the length of the campaign. I think that that's something that Canadians appreciate as well. You know, when they look down to the states, and it seems like it's sort of a perpetual election cycle here. Um, that I think Canadians appreciate that it's not like that in Canada. They can focus on one election at a time and then they maybe don't have to worry about it until the next one comes up. Yeah, looking from the outside, it's interesting to see a country that has multiple parties, five, six parties, um, but still has first past the post elections, meaning that you can have plurality winners and, and some of the challenges that creates for the system. I want to talk about though, the polls. Um, Eric, you track the polls for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. How successful, how spot on were the polls in this election? It looks like they'll be really, really close uh, because our last average had the Liberals ahead by about half a percentage point. And once all the ballots are counted, it might end up being a one point advantage for the Conservatives. So the polls actually did pretty well. And um, we saw that really throughout the country, a regional level polling, which is really important in Canada because of how our politics are are very regionalized. They also seem to be pretty close to the mark. Our national polling does do pretty well. We don't often have big uh, errors. And because of the fact that we are a multi-party system, it does mean that if they're off for one party, it doesn't mean that necessarily the other party that was just behind is the one who suffers. So we can sometimes have these smaller parties uh, tougher, to, uh, tougher to track. The People's Party, for example, though, some pollsters did have them at about 10% of the vote, and they ended up with five. It goes back to that challenge there was in identifying those voters and understanding really what uh, that electorate looked like. But this was actually a really good election for the polls in Canada. And we've had some campaigns where the polls didn't get so close, but this was certainly uh, one of the better ones, I think. For an audience that's pretty familiar uh, hearing us talk about the ways that polls are conducted in the United States, maybe this is a dumb question, but are polls conducted essentially the same way in Canada? More or less, but not exactly. We do a lot more uh, online polling um, than because in the United States, the media companies do seem to be much more closely involved with the polls. They put a lot more money into that. We don't have that here. There's very little money that comes from media companies that goes to polling. So a lot of the polls are done online. We only had one pollster that did a traditional telephone poll with live callers. The other polls that we have uh, pretty common are the uh, interactive voice response polls, which are the automated polling. Whereas in Canada, you are able to call cell phones with those, which I don't think you can do in the United States. So it is a little bit different. Uh, but the landscape is a little bit di uh, different in terms of the money. And also, we don't really have a registered voter, likely voter kind of model. Pollsters generally just weight their sample to the uh, general population and let turnout take care of itself. We don't try to usually make guesses at who's going to come out to the polls. Looking ahead to the future of Canadian politics from here, what are the biggest questions that you have? For me, it's the uh, leaderships of the Liberals and the Conservatives. Justin Trudeau has had two consecutive minority uh, election wins. And often that is taken as a signal that a change is needed. Um, you know, we had uh, results in this campaign and the last one that are almost identical. The last time that happened was in the 1960s. And the prime minister at the time, Lester Pearson, took that as a, as a signal that he needed to step aside. And he stepped aside and was replaced by Pierre Trudeau, who turns out to be Justin Trudeau's father. Um, so it's a, an open question whether Justin Trudeau will lead the Liberals into the next election. And the same thing for the Conservatives. Are they going to stick with this centrist path or are they going to go back uh, and try to go more to the right to try to, uh, you know, fend off the People's Party. I think those are the two biggest questions that have the biggest consequences for Canadian politics in the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. Those are the big questions. I think as far as sort of secondary questions, and you know, as someone who reports on extremism, I am interested in the People's Party. I'm very curious if their support was largely driven by the pandemic and the vaccine and the mass mandates and everything that was sort of riling people up at this time. And if we're past, hopefully, the pandemic by the time we have another election, will those sort of um, passions have cooled off at all? And will the party kind of dip back down to what we saw in kind of 2019 uh, levels? Uh, and then the, the future of the Green Party is just an open question mark that's very uh, interesting. There's, I could go on for a while, but the trouble that they've had this year um, 
but their own leader didn't win in her riding. And there's definitely some big question marks as to who's going to continue with that party, if they're going to keep their leader or, or replace her. Um, so I'm curious about some of the, the fringe parties as well. You know, I think to the extent that many Americans are familiar with Canadian politics, it's as a result of the kind of political celebrity of Justin Trudeau. Do you expect that this was his last election? I think that it might be. Um, he's been leader of the Liberals now for eight years. And uh, there's always been a thought that, you know, he wasn't planning to stick around for uh, maybe a, a very, very long time. Uh, he might try to stay on. He might see that this is a minority government and that the Liberals can't afford to replace him in the midst of a minority. Uh, but I think that it'll be challenging for him to make the case that he can win a fourth election. There's very few cases of prime ministers managing to do that. Uh, but it does depend on what happens in the House. If it's seen as way too acrimonious that they can't uh, have the luxury of a leadership race, uh, he might need to stick around. But uh, I, I think that if people are placing bets on whether he's going to be around for a fourth campaign or not, I'm not sure I would put my money at this stage. I'm probably in the same boat. I, there's sort of a tradition in Canada of if a politician is in power for too long, eventually everybody gets sick of them. It doesn't matter <laughs> how well they're doing. Um, so there, there typically tends to be a change, but you never know. Well, speaking of politicians who stick around for a very long time, we're going to talk about what German politics looks like in the wake of Angela Merkel. Um, so let's leave it there for Canada. Thank you so much for joining me today, Kaylee and Eric. Thanks. Thanks, Galen. All right, let's move on and talk about the German election. This Sunday is election day in Germany, and it's the first time in post-war Germany that the sitting chancellor isn't running for re-election. It also marks the end of a 16-year-long era of Angela Merkel's leadership. As Merkel leaves office, polling from Pew Research shows that, on average, respondents in advanced economies across Europe, Asia, and the Americas have more confidence in Merkel to do the right thing than any other leader polled. At home, the polling for Merkel's center-right Christian Democratic Party is more muddled. The party is in a tight race with the center-left Social Democrats and Green Party for the most seats in Germany's lower house of parliament, the Bundestag. Anything could happen, not only in terms of which party gets the most seats, but what kind of coalition is formed after the fact, given that no party is at all likely to win an outright majority. Here with me to talk about where German politics are heading is Berlin-based journalist and Politico Europe contributor Emily Schulteis. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Also here with us is Cornelius Hirsch, Politico intelligence analyst and co-founder of Poll of Polls, which tracks public opinion across Europe. Welcome back to the podcast, Cornelius. Hi, Gail. Great to be here again. The last time we talked to you, I think we were we were in the middle of some of the darkest days of COVID and talking about, you know, COVID related polling uh, in Europe. So I'm glad we have moved beyond that. And we have other uh, slightly more normal things to talk about, which is a regularly scheduled election in Germany. So first of all, let's get to kind of what really set the stage for this wide open race. Emily, why is Angela Merkel stepping down in the first place? Well, she's been in office for 16 years, and I think that's, you know, this is a country that doesn't have term limits, but it is a leader who sort of knows her limits and knows when she's uh, ready to exit the stage. And so she actually announced back in 2018, fall of 2018, that she wasn't planning to run again. And so, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a moment of openness in a way that, as you mentioned, Germany just really hasn't had. Normally you have... Uh, sitting chancellor running again, and either they're reelected or they get booted out of office. And so the idea that we don't have either of those situations this time around, yeah, it's it's been it's made for a, a very fascinating campaign and unprecedented campaign. Cornelius, do you think that Merkel could have won re-election if she sought it? Was this just understanding the political winds and saying, you know, Germans want something different? Or is it really just kind of a personal decision? I am done with this job after 16 years. That's, that's a good question, because um, something that has happened and which is actually quite striking over the course of this campaign is kind of this uncoupling of uh, the CDU, so Angela Merkel's party, party, the Christian Democrats, and her as a persona, because Angela Merkel herself is still extremely popular. She's still by far the most popular politician in Germany, trusted um, uh, across a, across party spectrums and just a very um, liked and likable um, um, politician, it seems, while her party has not done so well. So it, 
there could be the speculation that if she would have run again, she would have had uh, better chances than her uh, successor as party leader and chancellor candidate of the CDU, Armin Laschet, who um, has been uh, stumbling through this campaign, campaign a bit and has uh, also seen his approval ratings and with him, with, with him, or with his approval ratings, also the uh, polls for his party, the CDU, uh, seat dropping. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that. What happened? Because at the beginning of the year, the Christian Democrats looked in a solid position to maintain their position as the largest party in the Bundestag. Um, that is no longer the case. And the Green Party has taken uh, a turn leading the polls. And currently, the Social Democrats lead the polls. However, they're quite close. So kind of was there a, one particular impetus for the fall of the Christian Democrats? Um, yeah, since you since you brought up that the last time we talked, it was during the darkest hours of, the, of this pandemic, kind of, and it was also the time when we saw across Europe and also in Germany this rally around the flag effect with uh, the Christian Democrats of Angela Merkel really riding high, and it looked for a long time as if also the next election would be theirs uh, to lose. But then since then, as you've mentioned, uh, the polling trends have really more resembled a roller coaster. With for a while the Greens taking over, actually being in first place. Um, for a short period of time. And now in the final days, um, in the final weeks of before the election, the, in the final sprint, the Social Democrats taking the, uh, the poll position in the polling trends. But it's, it's hard to uh, pin down really the search of the Social Democrats um, to, one, uh, to one event. But what really was a striking moment in this election campaign or defining moment in this election campaign uh, were the deadly floods which hit Germany in the middle of summer, in the middle of July. Um, and after these events, um, and we really saw the, 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 the Christian Democrats um, going downwards in the, in the polling trends. I think it was always going to be not impossible, but a challenge for the CDU to hold on to the people who backed the party specifically because they liked Angela Merkel and not because they were particularly excited about the CDU's policies. But I think, I mean, as Cornelius says, there's not one moment that really strikes me as the, the, um, the rise of the Social Democrats, but there's kind of a couple small moments along the way that have contributed to the CDU's position. I mean, one of which being that, uh, I mean, Laschet, when he was elected the party leader in January, he was liked enough by people within his party, but I don't think there was ever that kind of enthusiasm about him that there is about Merkel. Earlier this spring, there were also a series of um, scandals involving members of the CDU who had, had sort of, long story short, used kind of their positions to secure masks and other protective equipment and benefited uh, quite prettily financially off of that. And so that kind of already tarnished the party a little bit. And then there was a very public race um, between Armin Laschet and the head of their Bavarian sister party, uh, Markus Söder, for who was going to actually be the chancellor candidate, which was, you know, played out in the media and in the public eye. And all of those things, you know, even before we come to the moment of this deadly flooding, were things that had chipped away both at the credibility of, of Laschet and the credibility of the party as a whole. That really has been interesting. So um, in, in hindsight, one or one could say that Olaf Scholz, so the chancellor candidate of the Social Democrats, which uh, currently, uh, as I said, is in pole position for Sunday's election, he more or less benefited a lot from the missteps also of the two other, other candidates of the, of the Greens, um, as well as uh, the Christian Democrats with these mask scandals that Emily mentioned, um, and also the, 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 this party infighting um, and the CDU not showing closed ranks to the same extent as the Social Democrats, which in the past were known actually for more in, in, uh, internal party rivalries uh, than, than the Christian Democrats. So it's been really an interesting campaign. You've mentioned some scandals. Are there key policy questions that have kind of organized this campaign at all? Or is it a lot of maybe more personality and uh, scandal driven like movements in the polls. One, one has to say that this election campaign did not have such a policy focus. There haven't been much policy debates which have driven uh, the election campaign. It was really one of the most uh, persona focused election campaigns uh, in a long time for, for German politics, um, which has been has been really striking. But I don't know if Emily also wants to chime in there. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, having covered US elections in the past, I think that's one of the things that stands out to me about this German campaign, um, as opposed to others, you know, 
Angela Merkel was already someone who had, had, had embraced this idea in some ways of personality-driven politics because the support for her really was so much about her as a person, her as a political persona. Um, but this time around, you've really seen, you know, maybe it's because voters have become used to that under, under Merkel, but you saw them sort of assessing each of the candidates this time around very much also based on those personality traits. And, um, you know, as Cornelius mentioned, when you've got a CDU candidate who's made some pretty significant mistakes. Uh, Annalena Baerbock, the candidate for the Greens, has also made some significant mistakes. And so, you know, people, people, instead of judging the, you know, the candidate by the party program, they're judging the candidate by the candidate, uh, which, which reminds me a lot more of an election back home than, than one over here. Right. I think we oftentimes look across the pond at parliamentary and in particular proportional representation systems um, and think like, oh, look, those politics are driven by policy. And clearly that's not always the case. No, that's definitely not the case. And also uh, I've, I've, I've mentioned that the, the voting intention polls have been volatile as, if, uh, as, as never before, but also when it comes to policy debates or issues which dominated um, the, the public discourse, um, also polls tracking which issues wet matter the most for Germans have been extremely volatile. We've, uh, two years ago, we had um, had a migration topic being on top of voters' minds, Then, but then, of course, the pandemic eclipsed every, everything or any, any debate um, and also all the lockdown measures and the debates around them. Um, and then only in recent weeks, we've seen, uh, especially also with the, with, the, with the flood events in the summer, the topic uh, around climate crisis and climate change being uh, again at the forefront of voters of voters minds and things that they found the most interesting so the pandemic and the lockdown stay freely eclipsed most of the policy debates i would say um and made it even easier for really this campaign to be uh focused a lot more on candidates and personas maybe outside of the things that are moving the polls in specific instances in this case what are the kind of driving conflicts in German politics? I mean, even you mentioned coronavirus and masking, there's still, at least in the United States, plenty of policy debate over how we should address COVID. Um, you know, kind of what are those debates within German politics, maybe pertaining to COVID, but maybe beyond that? And, and do each of the plausible chancellor candidates have a specific argument they're making, um, maybe, maybe despite the personality-driven politics? I do believe that that coronavirus politics are still um, relevant and and a significant part of what's being discussed in Germany. Although, unlike in the U.S., I think it's a lot less polarized in terms of um, you know which parties are in favor of you know certain restrictions and which ones aren't. Here, you have the far right AFD, which uh, is essentially argues along the same lines as as uh, sort of Trumpian Republicans in terms of anti-lockdown, anti-mask, anti-vaccine, uh, vaccine mandates, things like that. So that that does exist here, but it's it's a significantly smaller section of the kind of like total political landscape compared with the states. Um, I mean, I guess, Cornelius, I will hand it over to you too. The only other thing I would say in terms of a top issue is that because of the flooding this summer, climate change, it had already been over the last few years growing as a top issue for voters in Germany, particularly among young voters, but not exclusively. And I think that was one of these moments where, you know, for, for anyone who wasn't aware of what kind of impact uh, climate change is going to have, this, is, this was a case of this happening in Germany's own backyard. And it really made that issue uh, visible for people, I think, in a way that that is new, um, at least to that extent. Do you draw a direct line from those floods to uh, the Green Party, like for a brief moment, leading in the polls? No, actually, that's that's been really interesting because uh, the, the the moment when the Greens uh, uh, rode high in the polls that was actually before those uh, before those. Wow, look happened. at me! I'm good and, thing we have you here. Um, and so and so it's been uh, so it's been actually more the case uh, that one uh, that uh, observers were surprised that the Greens did not benefit more in the polls from uh, those events because actually they, they they had they were on a downward trend. Um, 
since their short uh, peak in the polls after they've announced their candidate and they, so we had like this kind of uh, convention or uh, attention bounce uh, with the when the candidate of the Greens, the Chancellor candidate Annalena Baerbock was announced and presented to the media and afterwards they've uh, been on a on a, a slow but steady downwards trend again and stand only at 16% so significantly behind the other two parties in the polls and they've have and the Greens have not been able to benefit significantly uh, from the climate events in the summer or this this flood events in the summer. Um, partly, this has uh, this can be also attributed to the strategy of uh, the Social Democrats with Olaf Scholz, who has been uh, quite eager to declare and announce publicly that he wants to um, govern with the Greens anyway after the after the election. And therefore, uh, signaling also to green voters that they could still vote for him and would still end up with the Greens in government. I think that's another kind of example of this kind of decoupling of of personalities and party programs or policy. Because you know, if if this election were not as personality driven as it is, I think you would have seen a, a bounce for the Greens in the wake of that because of the visibility of climate issues. But it came just after essentially two months in which Annalena Baerbock had made some high profile mistakes. And so, you know, if you're a voter trying to make a decision about not only what issue is the most important, but who do I trust most to tackle that issue, you might love the idea of the Social Democrats with the Greens at their side, pushing them to really focus on it. But with, you know, a a chancellor candidate that you, you know, see as as steadier and, and more competent. Speaking of, of more uh, of a candidate looking more trustworthy or more competent, one key moment which you haven't mentioned actually, according also in in regards to the flood events in the summer, was actually that uh, Armin Laschet, the lead candidate of the CDU, was caught uh, on tape uh, during a visit to the villages affected by those floods very heavily, and he was caught on tape uh, laughing in the background while the president of Germany, uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier, was giving quite a somber speech about the victims um, um, of the floods. And so this video. Of, of the lead candidate of, this, of who wants to become chancellor, um, laughing at a, in a very inappropriate moment, um, went viral in Germany, and this really uh, hit him hard. And we saw really after this event also his personal approval ratings plummeting. That's an interesting moment that you bring up. And now, as you mentioned, the Greens are at around sixteen percent. The Social Democrats are at twenty five, around twenty five percent, and the Christian Democrats at twenty one percent. You know, at the beginning of the year, I think Christian Democrats were around. 35% or higher. Um, so just to give so, some context there, when we talk about elections oftentimes on this podcast and talk about American politics more broadly, one of the focus is demographic divides, right? We have divides along race, education, geography, um, age. Does Germany see similar demographic divides? Um, and if so, how are they similar or different to what we see in the U.S.? Yeah, so Emily and I actually looked to get, uh, together at at at, uh, at the demographic breakdown also of the so-called Merkel coalition. So wh- how was Merkel able to to hold on to to, to those uh, strong numbers and securing um, election victories? And uh, what we found actually this was that um, Angela Merkel was able to hold together a coalition of uh, of more centrist voters, older voters, and more female voters. Um, and that's been that's been actually quite striking. But also Emily looked into more detail into the East-West divide. Also. Also of of uh, the voting intention for certain parties. Yeah, I think you know when when you think about the U.S., there's often a lot of discussion about this is the way that people vote on the coasts and in the big cities, and this is the play, this is the way people vote, you know, essentially everywhere else, right? And so in Germany, one thing I think that will be underscored on election night is the significant difference between the way the west part of the country votes and the way the former five former Eastern German states. Uh, vote, which is, you know, the Greens are significantly stronger in the West than they are in the East. They've really struggled to find a foothold across much of East Germany. And the far right is, um, at least according to some numbers that I saw earlier this summer, is essentially three times as strong in the East as it is in the West. So, you know, you're seeing um, in in most Western German states, single digit support for the far right, whereas I mean, in in Saxony two years ago, they won 27.5% of the vote, and there is a chance that they actually come in first in Saxony or in one other Eastern German state, um, Thuringia. And so, so those are that's one area too where you see, in some ways, it feels like two completely different electorates. So far, we have talked about kind of the 
political environment. But this is all going to be funneled through a pretty unique electoral system. So allow me to try to explain how I see the German electoral system. Please tell me if I'm right. And then I have some questions about how how this all works and the effect it has on politics. So when voters vote on Sunday, they're going to answer two questions. The first is who they want their local representative to be. So they vote for a specific person from any party. And then the second question is they vote for a party. And it doesn't have to be the same party as the person they voted for on the first question. The winners of the first question make up half of the seats in the Bundestag, and the rest of the seats are filled out so that parties have representation that is proportional to how voters responded on the second question. And the people who fill out those seats come from a party list that the party chooses that the voters haven't necessarily chosen. And then you have to get 5% or more of the vote overall in order to get any representation at all. Is that, have I, have I internalized that correctly? And the only thing I would say is that, um, so it's, it's not quite half that will essentially be made up um, from, the, from the second list. It's actually probably going to be significantly more. That number is variable each year, depending on a, a whole lot of complicated, um, you know, calculations that I think um, even I am, am not totally, uh, don't fully completely understand. But essentially, like there, there were 709 members of this last Bundestag, and from what we understand, there could be significantly more this time around based on who gets how many votes. That was what I was right, about to say. If if someone here wanted to do like a website like 538, they would have to change the name of that domain like every <laughs> five years because the German Bundestag does not know a maximum number of seats. So um, it currently has 709. But uh, depending on how many people split their votes, um, it could go up as, as high as 900 or even more uh, seats. Oh, wow. Okay, because... <laughs> Right. From what I understand, you a party might end up getting more seats than it proportionally deserves because of how people answer on the first question. And instead of like taking those seats away and saying, no, you don't get them, they just add more seats to other parties to make it all proportional yeah. in the end, um, is, exactly. is what so, I understand. So, so a very interesting, uh, somewhat complicated system there. So if, for example, a party wins more of those first vote direct uh, candidates through the first votes, then it would actually get to, uh, according to the strictly proportional voting of the second vote, then the fir- then it had this party has the right to get those so-called overhang seats, and all the other parties uh, may in turn get the so-called leveling seats in order to still have this disproportional uh, re- representation. And so this ensures at the same time that you can elect your local MP, um, and have it in, your, in, the, in the parliament, but that the overall seat distribution still stays representative. And this does sound smart in some way and, 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 and interesting maybe, but um, it also means that the Bundestag yeah, could end up with more than 900 seats in total, which of course is very costly. And the reform has been dragging on for a while because um, everyone agrees that this needs to change because we can't go, go on adding seats every time. And uh, sometimes they need, they, they just run out of space in that building actually. So the way that this, this was kind of like pitched or framed according to Deutsche Welle, the publicly funded German news outlet, they said, quote, the system seeks to combine the benefits of both direct and proportional representation while guarding against the electoral mistakes of German history, which saw political fragmentation during the Weimar Republic between World War I and World War II. Does this system accomplish that? Has this system thus far at least prevented political fragmentation? Do you expect it to continue to prevent political fragmentation? It has uh, prohibited a lot of very small parties to enter the parliament. There are always a lot of parties running in German parliament. I think uh, this time uh, more than 40 40, uh, um, lists are, are on different ballots. Um, and but basically none of those uh, new party lists will enter the Bundestag uh, thanks to this 5% threshold uh, that they would have to jump and no one gets, uh, none of the uh, newcomers uh, gets even close to that threshold. But when it comes to fragmentation, I mean, uh, this did not stop the this long-term downwards trend of the major center parties of the center left and the center right. So the social Democrats and the center and um, center right Christian Democrats. This downward trend um, of the, the former major parties has been visible in all uh, in, across Europe in different elections and also in Germany. This trend um, um, did not did yeah was not prohibited by by the electoral system. So we still see kind of an, a more um, equal vote share for more parties with now um, yeah 
the highest share being the Social Democrats at the moment, projected with 25 seats, uh, 25 percent, followed by the Christian Democrats 21, and then the Greens with um, with 16. So we see more parties being uh, almost at the same level. The other thing I would say, and this is not so much about the the bigger questions of you know what that's what it has or hasn't done for for democracy, more a question about what this does to watching on election night, um, you know, as Cornelius mentioned, having a, you know, some sort of uh, 538 like prediction system becomes very, very difficult when, you know, it is actually quite common that people say, all right, well, you know what, I like my local Greens candidate, but I think, you know, I want to make sure to vote for the SPD with my other list because with my other vote because I want them to come in first place and I want them to lead the government. And so, you know, a lot of times when you're seeing election night predictions about who's going to get how many votes, um, that's a very, it, it makes it in some ways a lot more difficult for someone to follow who's not, you know, I mean, even us as, as political journalists, it's, it's sometimes difficult to understand how that's happening. Um, whereas in the U.S., you're kind of seeing each house district and it's, it's pretty clear how that works. Yeah, I read that in 2017, 27 percent of Germans split their votes between different parties on the first and second question. Does that make polling in general more difficult in Germany? Uh, I mean, how accurate has German polling been? German polling has been uh, pretty accurate, actually, in the past. So um, I would expect with... nothing less from the Germans, even with such a complicated <laughs> system. What, what has been uh, almost impossible to do is seat projection. To, to actually, if you don't even know how many seats the next parliament is likely to have, it's very difficult to actually um, calculate a proper uh, seat allocation or a seat distribution. Um, but when it comes to the overall popular vote and the vote share, their polls have been uh, um, very um, consistently very accurate with around, yeah, the expectable two percentage points up or down that they've missed um, the final election results. Um, and oh, yeah, overall polls work very similar to to they do in the US. Um, but I would say on average, they've been uh, slightly more, more accurate, actually. As you mentioned, the kind of main center parties, center right, center left parties in German politics have declined in their kind of standing and support amongst the broader public. And as that happened, has happened, obviously, the country has relied on coalitional governments that um, and the most recent coalition, the one that Merkel was currently presiding over, was actually between the center right and the center left. So a kind of center party that is, is maybe pitting itself against the smaller, more radical parties from both the right and the left. Do you think that will continue to be the organizing principle of German politics kind of after this election, that it's it's the center is is responsible for forming a coalition that is that is maybe pitted in opposition to the farther right and left? Or is that about to change? I think that's going to change. I think having this this version of the coalition, which has actually been around now for eight years, um, has ultimately hurt both parties because it's this idea that, you know, you have voters sometimes who are a bit disaffected with the process who look and say, you know, I look at the parties and everybody's the same. And when they're governing together for eight years in a row, it's very easy to, you know, it's a convincing argument to make that that it is difficult to distinguish between the two. And so I think part of what's made this campaign so interesting is that for the first time, you're seeing them drawing these comparisons, not the first time, but you, you are again seeing some starker contrasts be drawn between the two of them. And I think it would be, frankly, in both to bar both parties' benefits and uh, to the benefit of preventing further, you know, political fracturization that they don't form another coalition uh, after the election. I don't think you'll see that. This consensus, yeah, this consensus of Angela Merkel, she was often accused of kind of lulling in uh, German uh, political debate, democracy, therefore, and um, seeing another grand coalition of the center right and the center left um, is is very very unlikely. For a while, it even looked like they would not even uh, mathematically uh, get a majority of seats in the next parliament when they were both didn't poll that well. Um, and so, for the first time, we uh, it's very very likely that after this election, we will see a three party coalition in Germany, which once again is also uncharted, uncharted territory for Germany. Now, it seems like whichever whichever party uh, gets the most seats is going to be relying on smaller parties to piece together their coalition. How strong are the smaller parties in Germany? And what are their politics like? Um, it, it looks it looks like like the Greens are very likely to enter the next the next uh, parliament, uh, the next government. 
they uh, are expected to make big gains uh, in this election um, and uh, will probably enter the, the, the next government. And then the big question is one, uh, what, who's going to be the third partner uh, who um, enters, uh, which, uh, who's going to be the third party and the third partner in this three-party coalition government uh, that Germany will see after this election. Um, and the coalition talks are expected to last quite a long time. Um, and it's going to be really interesting also to see how they play their hand um, uh, in order and, and how they play their leverage uh, in order to get certain minister posts um, and get also their writing uh, into the coalition pact that the three, three parties are expected to sign. Yeah, I mean, last time you saw um, there was an attempt at this three-party coalition last time between the CDU, the Greens, and the Free Democrats, which is the sort of liberal pro-business party. And those talks went on for, gosh, maybe a month, a month and a half, and then the talks collapsed. And then we, we came to this grand coalition that we've had for the last four years. And so, I mean, the process is, uh, it could be that the first uh, you know group of parties that starts talking is actually able to form a government, but it could be that they aren't. And then you just kind of keep moving along until eventually, eventually someone does, which we, you know, we, we don't know how many months that actually would be. So that, that, but what this definitely means is that uh, Angela Merkel will stick around as, as a, in a in a kind of a caretaker government for much longer than many observers might have uh, uh, thought, expected, or maybe also what she had hoped for. When it comes to the the arguments of some of these smaller parties, I think the alternative for Deutschland, the AfD, has gotten some press in the United States as being this kind of more far right, anti-immigrant, um, maybe conspiracy theory driven party. Um, of course, you mentioned that the Green Party has has gained ground. The left also, you know, party also um, will have enough support to gain seats in parliament. Emily, this is something that you that you've studied in particular. I'm curious, why are these parties gaining gaining influence um, and how are they are they going to gain enough influence that Germany is no longer going to be this kind of like um, you know, center driven, maybe slightly conservative, uh, you know, beacon of stability in Europe. I would separate the Greens from the other parties in that, um, in that discussion, because I think part of the reason that they have managed to make the gains that they have over the last couple of years is by sort of projecting a more centrist tone and a more pragmatic tone. They know, for example, that being part of a government means that you've got to be, uh, you know, pro NATO means that there's certain things, um, about about governing, about you know troops abroad, about national security, those sorts of things that that they're going to have to be at least tepidly on board with. So, so I think I guess I would I would say I, I feel like they are um, while not one of the two main traditional centrist parties, they are kind of moving in that direction, and I would consider them part of the the political center. I mean, as far as the as far as the AFD, the far right goes, you know. I think we're seeing this year that they have a pretty, at least as things stand now, they have a pretty clear ceiling of about 12, 13% nationally. Um, like I said, in the East, it can be significantly more than that, which, which shows, you know, that there are, there are still major contrasts between the two parts of the country, but you know, what they're good at, even if they're only going to win 11 or 12% in, in the next Bundestag, they in the past had been very good at, um, getting people to focus on their issues and at pushing, for example, the Christian Democrats to the right for fear of, of losing voters to them. And so you've seen that go away during the pandemic or relatively go away. Uh, I don't know to what extent they can sort of gain some of that, you know, rhetorical ground back. But, you know, when I think about, at least in the short term, their, their role is, um, you know, to, to sort of, to try and, and, find attention for their issues and to sort of force other parties to do things as a result rather than actually um, having a say in 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 governance or in policy i would say if there's one thing that this election campaign in germany has uh, has proven is that that, that, that germans uh, do not like the extremes and they they they, they will uh, that this, the elections are won in the center i mean even the, the center left um center left Social Democratic candidate tried to out Merkel, Merkel in some way as presenting himself as the moderate center candidate who's been governing with Angela Merkel for a long time and he will, who kind of will continue this this very moderate uh, w way um, of, of governing um, and uh, as have been also, also the Greens as, as Emily, Schultz, uh, Emily said 
have moved very much to the center all in their in their rhetoric um and uh same goes for the the the, the current candidate of the of Chris, of the christian democrats armin laschet um so there has been this like uh, many decades ago there has been this 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 uh this election poster by Konrad Adenauer which said keine experimente and I think this election campaign has shown that that kind of experiment is so no experiments is more or less the mantra of this country. Interesting. All right. Well, I think that is a good place to leave things, even amidst a wide open roller coaster of a race. No experiments remains the mantra. Thank you, Cornelius and Emily. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you so much, Galen. Thank you. My name is Galen Druk. Claire Bidegary Curtis is on audio editing. Nash Consing is on video editing. And Emma Riley is our intern. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we will see you soon.